let let's start with um the big bang cosmology um perhaps you could just sketch sort of where we were and, and where you feel we are now when it comes to the implications of big bang cosmology on our um, ideas about agency behind the universe. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And if you don't mind, I think there's a nice framing um, quotation for this discussion. And it comes from Richard Dawkins himself. He says that that the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if at bottom there's no, there's no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, where pitiless, blind, pitiless indifference is his shorthand uh, or poetic way of expressing the idea of strictly materialistic processes. And I love the, the 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 way he frames the issue because he's he's implying that metaphysical hypotheses, in his case, scientific materialism, in my case, theism, um, have uh, generate expectations about what we ought to see in the world around us. That metaphysical hypotheses, every bit as much as scientific ones, are testable against observations of of the actual physical and biological worlds. And so the question I raise in Return of the God Hypothesis is, well, is is that true, though? Is it true that what we observe is what we'd expect on a materialistic understanding of the origin of the universe, and the origin of life, and et cetera? And cosmology is the first place where I think it's pretty obvious that what the materialists expected to find is not what they actually ended up observing. And this has created cognitive dissonance through across now virtually a century, because the the first indications that the materialist expectation uh, was inconsistent with observations came in the 1920s, maybe even back to the teens. The, the, the standard understanding of the origin of the universe was that there had not been an origin event, that the universe was eternal and self-existing. It did not need an external creator. It had always been here, and therefore there was nothing external to it that needed to act to bring it into existence. It was what uh, uh, worldview scholars and philosophers sometimes call the prime reality. It was the, 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 it was the thing from which everything else came, matter and energy in space and time. And the, the big discovery of the night, at least by the 1920s, we were getting very strong inklings from observational astronomy that the universe was expanding outward in a, in a roughly spherically symmetric way. This came from the redshift data that, that, that Hubble was collecting at the uh, Palomar Observatory through his big 100-inch telescope. Um, previously, um, uh, 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 Vesto Slipher had been getting similar data about nebula before he knew that the nebula were actually galaxies. And so we had this observational evidence of an expanding universe. And just very simply, if you wind the clock backwards on that in the forward direction of time, you're, the universe is expanding. But in the, if you wind the clock backwards in your mind's eye and you realize that the galactic material would have been closer and closer and closer and closer together at every progressive point in the progressive past to eventually you reach a, uh, we, uh, reach a limiting case where everything would have congealed to a starting point uh, and arguably the beginning of the universe itself. And you had a parallel development in theoretical physics with Einstein's development of general relativity, 1915. He realizes that, uh, that, that from his own equations of uh, his own field equations, that the universe it must be dynamic and expanding um, if gravity, as he's conceived it, is the only force operating in the universe, then all the material of the universe would congeal upon itself and sit, and there would be no empty space. We'd be in one big black hole, but we don't live in that kind of universe, he realized. And there's empty space between bodies. So there must be a, a counteracting anti-gravity force that creates that empty space, which suggests a dynamic universe that's again expanding. And so Einstein famously jerry-rigged his own equations and uh, attempted to portray the universe as static, where the, in a way, so that what he did is he he uh, introduced a, a degree, an exquisite degree of fine tuning, so that he could depict the gravitational pull inward as exactly counterbalancing the the anti gravity force now known as the cosmological constant pushing outward. Uh, but later it was shown that that didn't actually work from the physics standpoint of things. Um, that even slight perturbations would cause either a recollapse or an expansion, and uh, and then and then there was the the, fine, the data from the redshift 
which showed that the universe actually was expanding. And Einstein famously in 1931 acknowledged this. He went out to the Hubble telescope and uh, had a look for himself with Hubble, famous newsreel footage. And then two weeks later, gives an interview with the New York Times and, and acknowledges that he was wrong, that Hubble and his colleague Hummison had shown that the universe was expanding. It was not static. There must be a beginning. And then we had you know, a century of debate about whether that, that initial conclusion held or not. But there was the steady state universe. There was the oscillating universe. There have been attempts to get around the beginning with quantum cosmology. But eventually, I, I think I, I think the consensus now that the universe uh, had a beginning and that even space and time are part of what came into existence, I think, is completely unexpected from a materialistic standpoint. The universe does not seem to have been eternal and self-existent. It had a beginning in the finite past. Therefore, that does raise the ultimate question of causality. What could cause matter, space, time, and energy to come into existence? And that question, I think, has re-raised the ancient considerations from the cosmological argument that the best explanation, the way I argue the case in the God hypothesis is that the best explanation for the origin of the universe is something that must trans transcend matter, space, time, and energy. And therefore, you start to, the, the, the kind of entity that, that has those attributes or that meets those criteria is is something like a personal god, an agent capable of initiating a change of state and who is has existence independent of the the physical world. And that that's uh, God fits that bill. And therefore, the way I argue the case uh, that I, I think that uh, either a, a deistic or a theistic God provides a better explanation for the origin of the universe than either a pantheistic or materialistic uh, worldview. A key question in all of this is whether the science, and you obviously cover this in great detail, does justify a beginning per se, because, and I'm not a, a physicist or a scientist in this area, but my, my basic understanding of one of the objections might be, well, at the point where you go back to that singularity, you're not dealing with normal physics anymore, um, time anymore. You're dealing with something quite different. Something very different is happening in those first, you know, tiny quantum seconds of the universe. And so to speak of it having been caused doesn't necessarily apply uh, when you're talking about a kind of a quantum field or fluctuation in quantum vacuum or whatever you might say is is that that at that first moment so so is it is it legitimate to sort of say something must have caused this when you're talking about something very very different to our normal experience at that point um it's a very perceptive question justin and something that i deal with in the last three chapters of return of the god hypothesis and i think it's the most original material in the book and that is um that I show that in a sense there's a decision tree. If you're a naturalist, you can, you, if you if you are content to allow uh, observational astronomy and general relativity to provide our best understanding of cosmology, including the the earliest and uh, uh, part of the universe, you do definitely get to a beginning. You can circumvent that conclusion or try to using what's called quantum cosmology and invoking the idea that that as you back extrapolate, that you get to a point where uh, you the universe would be small enough uh, that quantum effects would then come to predominate. We always have quantum effects with us, but they would become, they would predominate. And that's the idea behind quantum cosmology. And what I show in the book is that, well, if, if you, if you, if your cosmology is based on general relativity and observational astronomy, you get to a definite beginning, and that raises the set, uh, question of ultimate causation. Um, but I then, but then I show that that quantum cosmology itself has its own theistic implications, and the the some some of this you, you have to get into the, some of the math of this. But basically, what happens in quantum cosmology is that the earliest state of the universe is depicted as a what's called a universal wave function. It's something come, that rather comes out of a universal wave function, which is not a physical state, but a state of math, but, but rather um, a description of mathematical possibilities. So you have this strange paradox in quantum cosmology where you get a physical universe out of, out of pure mathematical possibility. And um, Hawking himself was very worried about this. He, he said, you know, what puts fire in the equations that give them a universe to describe? How, and uh, mo even more uh, poignantly, Alexander Vilenkin, another advocate of quantum cosmology, in the end of his little book, uh, Many, U Many Universes in One, 
says, be before there was matter, space, time, and energy, what tablet were these quantum physical equations written on? Um, because he says, mathematics in our experience is conceptual and concepts exist in a mind. So if we're saying that the universe came out of math, essentially, are we really saying that the universe came out of a mind? And so what I, I go into great de detail on this in the uh, chapters uh, 17 and 18 in, in, in Return to the God hypothesis, hypothesis to show that in two separate ways, if you want to, there is a way to circumvent the conclusion of an absolute beginning. Although even there, not entirely, because the singularity in, in, quantum, in quantum cosmology is never eliminated. Um, it's eliminated as an intermediate step in a mathematical transformation that Hawking performs, but he acknowledges that that intermediate step exists in the realm, it's in the realm of imaginary numbers and has no physical correlate. And so if you convert back to real numbers, the singularity reappears. So in Valenkin's um, uh, quantum cosmology, there is still a singularity, an absolute beginning. It's also presupposed in the hawking hartle model and is not really eliminated except as Hawking himself acknowledges as a mathematical trick. So the, the first thing to say is that you don't actually get rid of the beginning in quantum cosmology. But secondly, the attempt to get rid of it depicts the universe as arising out of a purely mathematical state. A quantum field um, or a, a, a quantum foam is not a physical state. It's a description of mathematical possibilities. And even so, even beyond that, the mathematical possibilities have to be constrained in order to get a universe like ours as the natural outcome. And so and the, the, those mathematical possibilities are constrained by the choice of the physicist. And so you have a big hairy equation in quantum cosmology called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. It's the analog to the Schrodinger equation in ordinary quantum mechanics. It's, it has an infinite number of solutions because it is a, a, a type of differential equation that has an infinite number of solutions. So the quantum cosmologist wants to says they'll explain our universe if the solution to the, the, the equation gives a wave function that includes our universe as a possible, as a, as a reasonable possible outcome. But you can't get such a solution until the physicist constrains the degrees of mathematical possibility and essentially inputs information into the mathematical apparatus so that they can depict our universe as a natural consequence of all that. So you've got the universe coming out of math, but also coming out of a math that has to be artificially constrained by an intelligence to get the right answer. It's a teleological end directed simulation. So you've got what you have is a mind inputting information to simulate the origin of the universe. That's what's happening in quantum cosmology. So I think actually the move the the, the move to go to quantum cosmology to get around the clear evidence at the beginning just ends up adding additional weight to the theistic argument. Just one more question uh, as we close out well, this section. That was a little long on, and complicated. On, no, no, it's it's fine. <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's all good stuff. Um, I mean, to what extent would you say there is a uh, potentially uh, a bias at play among some scientists who are committed to say methodological naturalism to want to avoid, as it were, any possible divine foot in the door? Um, I know, for instance, that that you know when these models were first being proposed, Fred Hoyle was not a fan of them, arguably simply because he didn't like the implications he, he was he was explicit about that and and that you know that he was he coined the term the big bang as a pejorative to make fun of it he said he was a democratian he didn't believe that that something could come from nothing and he didn't like the idea of invoking a cause that he could never verify well uh, understandable but science involves invoking all kinds of postulates that we cannot directly verify. Science has a structure where we infer from what we see to sometimes what we cannot see, and we hold as real those things that we cannot see because of their explanatory power with respect to the observables. And if that's legitimate to do that for subatomic particles or, or subsur sur subsurface geological structures or uh, molecular biological structures, or if you're a psychiatrist, states of, of mind and your patient, uh, why is that a legitimate move to infer to an unobservable intelligent agent responsible for the origin of the universe? Um, the causal profile that's required to account for what we see 
directly matches what theism affirms about God. And so th this is not an intellectually illegitimate move. This is the kind of thing that scientists and philosophers do all the time in inferring an unobservable from the observables where the observable entity inferred has the attributes that, if true, would be necessary to explain what we see. Mm. And you're right. Back, yes. I'm sorry, I went philosophical on you, but just history of science, you had multiple attempts to circumvent the idea of a beginning. And in Hoyle's case, he was very explicit about his, his metaphysical motivations. He did not like it. He was a scientific materialist at the time. He then later changed his worldview, though, in response to his own discovery about the fine-tuning of the universe that was necessary to account for, for carbon in particular and life in general.